Welcome back after a very delicious lunch. My name is Bindi Vora, I'm the curator at Autograph, and I've had the pleasure of working with Shreya and Mark over the last year to convene this gathering that we're all attending today, both in person here at the Building Center, but also online. So welcome back. Um, the third panel for today is titled Repair and Reparations, and the session looks at the intersections of art, history, and the prevalent knowledge systems that continue to persist. Across all three papers we will hear now each seek to redress the complex legacies and structures of power, the repercussions of erasure that continue to shape, and how this might affect legislative justice. The segment of this panel will be split into two parts. For part one of the session, we are joined online today by Gerald Torres, who is the Professor of Environmental Justice and Professor of Law at Yale University. As an innovator in the field of environmental law, Torres has spent his career examining the intrinsic connections between the environment, agricultural and food systems, and social justice. His research into how race and ethnicity impact environmental policy has been influential in the emergence and evolution of the field of environmental justice. Gerald will present his paper for about 20 minutes. We'll open it up to a short Q&A, and then I'll be back to introduce uh, the second part of the panel with Sasha and Adrian. So if we can see if Gerald is here. Um, so I, I apologize for not being able to be there uh, in, in person with you. Um, I, I thought it was very rich. The morning was incredibly rich. Uh, I hope I can add a, a little bit. I want to thank everyone to, um, who invited me and uh, who made it possible for me to, to participate in this. And um, just as a, 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 a something that you, you all might be interested in, the, um, a, a colleague of mine has just written a book uh, uh, with Cornell, it's not out yet with Cornell University Press um, on what she calls artivism, which is uh, the uh, use of art and activism for uh, social change. So that's uh, it. Kind of seems like it fits with the the general uh, approach here. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen and and I um, have a series of slides and uh, I have a series of colleagues who are uh, quite upset with me because I'm supposed to be at a PhD uh, com committee meeting um, right now. Uh, so um, if, if, I, if, I, if I seem tense, you'll know the reason why. Uh, <laughs> so let, 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 let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, so I, I hope everyone can see that. Um, yes? No, yes? yes? Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> um, what, what I, what I want to do is, is, um, is talk about the, you know, the relationship between the climate change activism that's occurred, uh, and, and the, the process of, uh, colonization, uh, and the, the relation between colonization and extractivism is, has been talked about uh, today, and to try to pull those into uh, uh, some uh, relationship, um, and then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see if it makes sense. So the first thing I want to do is, of course, um, uh, you know, show you something that everybody, of course, recognizes, but, but you need to, I think it's good to remind ourselves, right, what the, what the global dis, uh, distribution uh, of wealth is, um, and that uh, the, you know, the role in uh, uh, kind of historic roles of, of uh, uh, colonialism and global capitalist expansion, of course, uh, has resulted in the, in the distribution that we see but it's you know tied to this wealth is of course uh, um, the maldistribution of of environmental burdens uh, as well as the uh, the um, division of the globe into uh, places where you know resources come uh, and uh, 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 where uh, um, uh, value is, is is produced. So the the um, one of the 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 points that I, I, I want to make is that that the the historic evolution of this is obviously long, 
Uh, and um, the idea of a global system, right, is in fact a, a very old, uh, old idea. You know, the recent commentary about about uh, glo globalization, in fact, misplaces the uh, the 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 pace uh, of the process. Uh, uh, the you know the uh, development of uh, you know global the global slave trade of course is an example of of that. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Well, if I can go to the next screen. Uh, oh. All right. Um, so that it, it, if you if you understand uh, the world creating nature of colonialism, then there's two things that follow from it. At least there's obviously more, but at least two. One is that if, if if colonization was a world creating process, then decolonization also has to be a world creating uh, project. Uh, and sustainability, to the extent that, and it's a you know that's a complex idea actually. Sustainability is part of the project of a world creation, which is the project that we should be part of. Uh, and then second is that extractivism is a way of understanding the process of capital accumulation. accumulation and uh, value flows within a global economy. Uh, but as a, uh, a as a concept, it also suggests a varieties of uh, politic, political and uh, analytic responses. And part of the, the papers that, that I was listening to this morning suggest uh, the varieties of those of the, those responses. But they all have to be contained within uh, this idea that you know what we're what we're doing is is a a, a, a world creating project and, and we have to be committed to that. So the, uh, the the climate crisis, of course, is the thing that that uh, draws a lot of this into uh, uh, um, you know into the most direct relief. But the, the 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 climate crisis, which has generated you know focus on things like uh, sustainability uh, and, and resilience, those concepts, as they emerge from the global north, of course, uh, are are take a lot of their meaning with a within the context of an extractive world system without uh, um, understanding exactly what. A sustainability and uh, uh, resilience would look like in a more just uh, uh, world. Um, so let me give you an example. So you know the current um, one of the current fads uh, in the sustainability uh, process, uh, especially by uh, global financial uh, 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 movers, right? Is the is the what, what are called uh, just energy transition projects. Now, just energy transition projects, right? The best face you put on them is that these are projects that produce uh, alternative energy um, uh, systems for the, uh, uh, the the global south, right? Uh, one of the difficulties when you start to look at these projects and look at the the the, uh, the financial instruments that create them. And the way they uh, intersect with uh, with local uh, um, economic priorities is th 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 that they don't fit, and and that the the process of a just energy transition, as defined in these projects, in fact, uh, uh, is often in conflict with the economic priorities of the the nations that they are working in. Uh, and often don't take into account um, different cultural uh, uh, impacts. So that that you know the this idea that we're going to transition to a green energy, which is of course a, a, a global north uh, project, an idea of of how we sustain, or how we achieve sustainability, right, is already complicated because it's it's Im embedded. In a, a system of uh, of uh, priorities and control that are not um, indigenous and uh, uh, in the, the countries in which they are they are being uh, placed, so that uh, the Olafemi uh, Taiwo, um, some of you may know his work, right? Uh, it suggests that that uh, in order to um, oh sorry. 
in, in order to uh, to uh, achieve climate just the climate justice, right? You have to have both racial and economic uh, justice, and and one w- without the other, uh, in fact, uh, is an incomplete system. And that the idea of uh, reparations, which of course has a troubled uh, um, a troubled uh, history in, in certainly in the United States and in the West in general, right? It has it's got to inform the way we think about how uh, um, uh, value flows are designed and in which direction uh, they they run. So that that. If you, once you understand the the, the process of uh, colonization, then the process of decolonization has got to not just be free from the the the, the metropole, but to, to to reverse the 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 value flows that uh, have been historically uh, created. Um, there are some nations uh, like uh, the Caribbean nations right, that have already uh, undertaken to put that. Uh, Particular idea on the agenda, and they in fact were central for getting the uh, the lost damage uh, 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 plank in the in the latest COP, right? So that uh, um, the uh, Olafeme uh, argues right that that climate justice is the achieving climate climate justice is essential for averting a catastrophe. Uh, and that we need to take seriously the project of rebuilding institutions. So, so uh, reparations isn't just about money, right? It's actually changing the way in which we uh, organize uh, um, decision making uh, and the way in which we conceive of the ideas that have uh, pushed and generated um, generated. Uh, the claims about uh, uh, su- sustainability. So loss and damage, right, is the, 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 the internationally is the, the, the rubric under which these fall, but there's no official definition uh, of uh, loss and damage. The, uh, the uh, calculation of uh, what the damages are, right, isn't fixed, but in fact is like, can be outlined, right? But also uh, is one that is continuing to accumulate, and so the questions of sustainability and resilience have got to continue to take into account how you calculate what the uh, the, the uh, loss and damaged uh, 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 amount or w- w- will be. You know, it's um, you know when you think about about uh, reparations and loss and damage, right, and things like that, and people often view them as 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 as, as kind of controversial. You know, it's it's important to recall, right, that that uh, you know uh, Haiti uh, right, just recently finished you know compensating France for the loss of the property that it suffered when when Haiti revolted. So this idea of Compensating people for compensating other countries, compensating the uh, the colonial power for the loss that they've suffered as the nation as the world has decolonized, right? Has it, it kind of exactly backwards? Yet it's that backwards notion that uh, uh, has carried the the legal day. Um, and so, what we have to do is to ask if we're going to reconstruct the world system. Right. Then we have to take uh, the uh, the questions of uh, compensation, the questions of controlling uh, capital uh, uh, formulation, the question of production seriously, and to, that entails both an economic, of course, uh, and a, a political question. We have to uh, frame it within. Uh, those boundaries in order to have a, a, a serious, uh, serious discussion about them. So um, that's uh, that's my brief talk. Um, and what I want you to think about, and the challenge is 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 to is to, to, to imagine right a, a world transformed, and what would that world look like? 
what you know not to say it's going to be easy not to say it's not it's 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 there's not tremendous resistance right but we've got to imagine what the transformed world will look like in order to act to move uh, in in that direction so uh, with that i'll stop that's about 20 minutes and i'll be happy to answer any questions uh, or or avoid them if i can <laughs> Thank you, Gerald, for that incredible presentation. I think for me, what it kind of drew upon was some of the previous sessions from this morning, where it looked at these tensions that are created and, and actually what, what comes of those tensions. I know you opened up a very generous question for us all that are here to consider, and, and I don't want to hold up too much time, so I wonder if there are any responses to the kind of proposition Gerald put forward to us just now to think about what what it could look like, what, is, what does these acts of change or these tools that we might you know, adapt to or use or utilize and what that might look like. So I don't know if anybody has any comments or questions. Yeah, we've got one at the back. Um, hi, thank you. I really appreciated your talk. Um, you brought up some really important points about the voice of the West um, and particularly, I'm really interested at this moment of the relationship between whiteness and the knowledge production coming out around climate crisis and mitigation and loss and damage. I've recently been making a documentary on the origin of climate crisis in Barbados and how it's kind of fueled what's happening across the world. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot when we're talking around the history of coloniality is actually the entanglement of whiteness and the uh, positioning in the environmental movement today of whiteness. And I'm interested on what you're thinking around decoupling from that ideological perspective and framework, but how do we also make sure that the knowledge that is coming out is from the Caribbean, is from India, is from Ghana, and that it is more robust in the way of thinking away from these colonial frameworks. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what you're imagining and what, how do we move the voice from the voice of uh, environmental degradation and whiteness? Uh, let, let, me, let me answer in two, in two ways. Um, uh, domestically, uh, um, uh, I'm working in two areas. So environmental justice, I work, I work with, with from the ground up, right, with the communities that are that are uh, suffering the 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 um, the uh, um, kind of the the hardship produced by our industrial economy. That's one. The other thing I'm doing is I'm working with with native groups to do two things. One, to incorporate. Uh, traditional ways of uh, of uh, understanding resource management from the tribal perspectives, so that that like currently, for example, I'm 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 teaching a class with the uh, with the uh, Salish Kootenai College in Montana and Yale, and I have brought these students together, but it's being driven by the the native notion of of how we need to think about resource management. So so that's that's one thing. You know the the Caricom. Uh, the the union of, of Caribbean countries, right, it, 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 it is 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 um, quite strong on stating that that the uh, the the damage they suffered is a direct re result of the uh, uh, colonization of the Caribbean uh, islands, the 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 just uh, energy transition um, partnership that I mentioned in passing it actually was an attempt by the uh, you know global financial parties to to push South Africa to adopt a uh, um, uh, an energy transition that in fact would have derailed some of the domestic industries within South Africa and in fact would have taken the developmental imperatives of South Africa and pushed them in a different direction. That's the kind of, uh, you know, listening to the to the re resistance is where we um, can get, a, a, in my view, uh, a, a decolonial voice in in the debate and and uh, not have it completely structured by the, 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 the voice of the global north. 
Um, we have one at the back and then Adrian. Uh, th thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I actually have like one comment and one question. Uh, comment is, thank you for highlighting that actually green transition is, has become embodiment of whiteness. It's not green, it's violent transition uh, in countries which were formerly colonized and now double colonized by this kind of neoliberal language. Uh, so thanks for highlighting that. But I was thinking more in terms of how we're seeing increasingly that Western countries, global north in general, are uh, kind of moving away. And, uh, and we've seen this in loss and damage uh, discussion that there was no uh, compliance agreement being made for monetary compensation. Um, so, so kind of what kind of um, pathways do you think is useful to think about? Because um, often we see that Global South is only used as a case study to illustrate problem and frameworks defined in the West. So we're still kind of already using frameworks that are based somewhere else that don't complement histories of exploitation and ongoing process of colonial. But thanks for, your, thanks for saying mm -hmm. about it. I, I, I wish I had a re ready answer for that, but, but let me say that, that but for uh, CARICOM in particular, but, but for uh, 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 you know, uh, countries from the global south, the idea of uh, loss and damage recovery would not have even been on the agenda. Remember, remember, our the United States representative to the to the the Egypt COP, right? Said, you know, loss and damage that's off the table. We're not going to think about it. By the end of the conference, it was on the table. Now there's it, there's the the it's a precious little there right now, but it is no longer for 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 forbidden to. Uh, to, to talk about it, right? So, um, I mean, that that's a, 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 a it seems to be a, a, a critical a critical move. The other thing that we you need to be careful about, right, is what's called scope three, uh, uh, the scope three process in reducing uh, greenhouse gases. And scope three refers to uh, getting uh, uh, participants in the value chain to reduce their emissions. In order to uh, uh, permit the uh, larger companies, right, that 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 to, to capture those emissions in their uh, uh, greenhouse gas accounting, well, you know, it sounds like well, this is a great thing. We're going to push, you know, the 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 value chain and make the value chain cleaner. But of course, then you have to ask who is in that value chain and how is that structured? And what you don't want is for this seemingly good idea to be just another expression, in my view, right, of, of uh, uh, extraction from the, 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 the countries that are producing the material for the, the, the products. And so, you know, we need to be careful when you when we confront these ideas, these these legal plans, to uh, to ch challenge them uh, it, it precisely on the terms that I suggested. I think we have one more over there, one at the back. I don't know if there's any in the Q and A as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Thank you uh, for the for the presentation. It was terrific. Um, obviously, loss and damage tends to focus on things that you can quantify. Uh, I wonder if you could say a few words about what's badly described as non-economic loss and damage, and um, maybe what are some of the ways that you think about it? I'm glad all you guys ask easy questions. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that's happening actually uh, inside the United States government, which is a major change, Right, uh, and it could, of course, easily go away. Right, is, is to think about um, how you quantify what are you know called in the literature ecosystem services, right, and and how you have to uh, uh, then factor those into the uh, uh, the the calculations when you're making a regulatory uh, decision. You know, we might take some lessons from that. To ask, uh, um, you know, how can this be generalized? That's one. But when you like, when you're dealing with uh, native groups, indigenous groups, right? There are there are other aspects of uh, of uh, loss that have to be uh, uh, taken into account. Um, uh, things that are sacred and, and and religious don't have a a, a uh, an economic value. 
but it doesn't mean they're not valuable. And what we need to do is to talk about, uh, at least get the conversation beginning to, to be about how we factor, how we create processes that protect those things that don't have ec an economic value. And I'm not sure what what that's going to look like. I know I, I, because I'm a lawyer, and so I'm just a lawyer, right? <laughs> uh, uh, um, you know, I speak largely from the American tradition. There's tremendous both push to do that and then tremendous resistance, right? And there's resistance, the push and the resistance are both in the same government, right? This is, I'm not, I'm not even talking about private actors, I'm just talking just about inside the government because there's some people who recognize that, that uh, uh, we have to start talking about this in order to think about how we, we integrate it. Uh, and then there's others who say, if it, you know, if it, if it doesn't figure on a ledger, it doesn't really count. I think we'll take one. Answer, Thank you. We'll take one more from the room, and then we'll open up for the Q and A. Um, Jay, I think, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I had a question about language. Um, I come from a background of natural science as a researcher, and I recently came across the concept of eco linguistics, which focuses on trying to decommodify the language that we use around resource management. So it's interesting that the event is referring to ecological extraction um, as opposed to resource extraction. But I wondered what your opinion is about the importance of language in framing the future of sustainability and how we work within a colonial linguistic landscape to decommodify our language. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I am not an expert in that, but I couldn't agree more with the impulse, right? So that, you know, for example, you know, um, a, a friend of mine writes about uh, kind of pre-syllabic uh, native languages in North America and has long said that, you know, uh, that, that literature has to be included within the corpus of what we consider American literature, right? So that, that, that thinking, thinking differently about how we talk about things like, is, is, I think, critically important. It's, it's, it's critically important so that, uh, um, you know, what, when I was discussing the, 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 the tribal resource management, you notice I still said resource management, right? The, the, uh, many of the, the native people I deal with like, want to talk about, about stewardship in one context, management in another context, and even moving from, from management to stewardship means that you're going to integrate certain and different values. So I think we've got time for two questions from the Q&A, um, and then we'll have to move on, but it's really interesting. Okay, um, the first question online is from Britta. She says, your talk reminded me of an argument I had with my husband the other day. He is a fuel <laughs> cell scientist, alternate energy, and he was saying how annoyed he was that the huge solar project in the Sahara was being blocked, he said, by dictators. He doesn't seem to understand how much colonization and projects are still so entrenched in inequality. My question would be, do you, have you, tried to engage the science audience? I feel like we here understand this, but people who are trying to invent these projects don't. Um, I, I, I absolutely, I've tried to engage the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the science and the development community. I mean, okay, beginning this, later this semester, I'm uh, offering an online course on clean and equitable energy development, right? Uh, because what I want to do is to, is to get those ideas uh, factored into the thinking. And this involves the scientists, the engineers, as well as the planners, as well as the, the, the communities. Um, uh, and so that's, you know, yes, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, you know, it, 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 what your husband said, right, might not be completely inaccurate. There might be dictators that are, that are trying to extra extract rent from these projects, right, and, it's, and so are blocking them. And without knowing more details, right, uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't comment on a particular project, but we do need to talk. The, the scientists. One of the pro, one of the things I've tried my whole career is to is to get policy people as and scientists, right, to to be able to at least know what questions to ask of one another. And so I think that's a, that's actually a really important important point. I think we have time for yeah, just one more. 
Okay, this is an anonymous question. Uh, the person thanks you and says, you importantly link the praxis of responding to and transforming environmental extractivism to responding to and overturning racism and white supremacy. What are implications of this kind of link, this entanglement for the praxis of teaching and curriculum to facilitate this kind of critical orientation? Um. <laughs> Um, That's quite a tough question. <laughs> in, in the United States, half of what I teach is illegal in the other half of the United States, right? <laughs> uh, 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 but, 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 A, you, 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 you know, if you confront, uh, uh, if you confront decolonization, right, uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a comment, right, that I like to use, Right, two that are true that gets people to understand this, right? Like behind, you know, back of Manchester, there was there was Mississippi, right? And that racism didn't create slavery; slavery created racism, right? As it, and so you need to understand the way the processes move, and you need to to get people to understand that the kind of the social categories that we use have kind of material reference. A, a, and you have to get them to recognize what those material references are, both historically uh, and, and economically historically, but historically. And then you can start to talk about um, it, that the necessity of dislodging things like white supremacy, right, in order to be able to see clearly what the uh, solutions for the crisis, the, the environmental crises that we're facing really are. And, you know, not everybody likes that. Um, I know there were many more questions, both in the room and online, but I'm so sorry we've run out of time. But if you could all join me in thanking Gerald Torres for his wonderful presentation. Let me thank you. Let me thank you. This is, this is wonderful. I've, I've, I've got to run to my PhD committee. I'm sorry, we missed all of that. Everyone was cheering too loudly. Oh, I, I said I apologize, but I have to run to my PhD committee. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so okay. much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Um, for the second part of the session for repair and reparation, we will hear in, in the building center two presentations, one by Sasha Huber and the other by Adrian Lahoud. Sasha Huber is a Helsinki-based multidisciplinary visual artist of Swiss Haitian heritage. Sensitive to the subtle threads um, connecting history and the present, she uses and responds to archival material within a layered creative practice. Huber frequently reclaims and aware of its symbolic significance, the compressed air staple gun, as an artistic weapon, as a way to renegotiate the unequal power dynamics. Today, her performative lecture, Repar Reparative Interventions, Renegotiating Archive Memory in Place, draws on her long-term research and contribution to the demounting Louis Agassiz campaign, which aims to dismantle the glaciologist's lesser known but contentious racist theories. Central to Huber's work tailoring freedom are a series of photographs made in 1850 of seven enslaved individuals on the South Carolina plantation in the US. This talk amplifies the legislative case, the connections to the archive through agencies of change. Based on the open letter bought by the descendants of Agassiz, who wrote to Harvard University to repatriate the photographs and return them to the descendants of those portrayed. Um, the second presentation is by Dr. Adrian Lahoud, who is the Dean, School of, Dean and School of, at the School of Architecture and Fellow at the Royal College of Art. His research uh, work is focused on architecture and urbanism, uh, urbanism within the Global South. In 2019, he curated the inaugural Sharjah Architectural Triennial, the first major international platform for architecture and urbanism in the Global South. That sounds like a repeat. He sits on the board of the Architecture Foundation, Design Museum, Future Observatory, and New Architecture Writers. Central to his presentation today, Nogura, too, is an 8 by 10 uh, meter painting created by 40 indigenous Australian artists from the Great Sandy Desert. 
The painting was used as proof of land tenure in a landmark native title case. He will examine the creation and uses of cultural artifacts in struggle for land rights as spaces of political creativity that mobilize intergenerational ideas of inheritance and sovereignty through aesthetic and spatial means. So please welcome Sasha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here, Mark, Bindi, and for organizing this incredible conference. Uh, so the, um, the performative portion of my short talk is the reading of that letter of the descendants. But before I do that, I wanted to give a bit of an idea uh, where this all started. Uh, 2004, I discovered a staple gun for me during the, my MA studies, and my, um, it was from a visual decolonial perspective dealing with people that were with responsible of the troubles in Haiti. And that came uh, as a reaction to my mother not wanting me to go to Haiti to meet um, our family. And that made me to want to know more about the reasons why is it uh, in Haiti as it is. Um, and now it's very um, actual what is um, what is troubling us, what's going on at the moment. So my sister then gave me this book that was published 2005, which is about Swiss involvement in the slave trade and slavery, anything that we didn't learn at school, even today, it's not really teached. Switzerland didn't have a colony, but many colonists and contributed to the wealth that we have there in Switzerland. And it was written by the... Um, political activist Hans Fassler, who also wrote about Haiti's connection, and I felt I need to meet him. I contacted him, and and uh, we uh, met first time in June 2006 in in Switzerland. And I um, we got to talk, and I could show him my work. It was this portraiture series, shooting back reflection on Haitian roots, where I, for the first time, shot back at individuals. Um, and then from that moment on, he kept me informed about uh, his activities. In 2007, he founded the Dick Mounting Louis Agassiz campaign. Uh, one chapter in this book was about this Louis Agassiz. Who was he? He was a Swiss glaciologist, having over 80 places named around the world after him, plus on the moon and Mars and seven species, so he's kind of all over the place. Um, this happened even after he moved to the States. I just wanted to quickly say something about these archival images. This is um, after the big earthquake in San Francisco in 1906, so the nature took care of its own, um, and it's a very powerful image. And I used it for the first time during a residency in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where there is many earthquakes, and the exhibition was called Agassiz Down Under. <laughs> <laughs> so Hans noticed that in 2007, when Agassiz's birthday was celebrated, that he was really celebrated, everything was about his marriage relation relating to the glaciology, uh, ice age theory, which he didn't invent, but it sounded like he did how he spoke about it. And he um, knew that after Agassiz moved to the States, he was invited by Harvard in 1846 to lead a lecture uh, series um, that um, he then saw black people for the first time. And what it did, did to him, he developed in becoming one of the most influential racists uh, of the 19th century. Um, he was one of those suggesting segregation in a governmental level, was a foreigner of apartheid, really. So he then started, Hans started then this um, campaign and invited me to be part of the committee. And the idea of the committee was to rename one of the mountains in the Swiss Alps on the border between the canton Bern and Wallis after Renti. Um, Renti was... Um, this gentleman, Randy Taylor, he was Congolese born still um, before he was kidnapped and enslaved on a South Carolina plantation. At that time, the new technology of photography was invented and Agassiz used it uh, to document, also he commissioned um, a photographer 
to uh, document seven enslaved people on, on a uh, plantation um, among Renti was also his daughter Delia. So the idea was to rename the mountain after Renti in honor of Renti and people who experience similar fates. And this was the moment when I really felt that I want to do more than just you know, give my name. It was for me then at that time, the first time where I felt I need to leave the space of the studio and, and go out. And then I started to plan my uh, first, that I call nowadays, reparative intervention to the mountain. And I made this sign of, uh, with Renti Horn on it, a short story, what is it about? And my first idea was to go by foot to the mountain, but I couldn't mountain climb something I couldn't practice in the flat land of Finland, where I live since 2002. But I didn't want to lose time, so I had to go in this way through the air. Um, it was really about the moment of changing that um, name in this symbolic, but still mm, um, real renaming. And I didn't ask any permission to do this, really. Um, I just then went there. Uh, with my photographer and started also a petition website um, where people around the world could give their name if they uh, liked this idea and it's still online actually. Um, I made a drawing of Renti dressed up because all the in persons were, on, they were literally stripped uh, of their humanities without clothes, photographed. Um, so I made this drawing to symbolically give this uh, dignity back because I mm, kind of tried to imagine how it must have felt like standing in front of strangers, in front of this uh, wooden box, looking at uh, the people and not knowing what it does. So I assume that they didn't never seen what came out of those uh, photographs. Um, this was then the installation. Um, then I want to show you places that have been renamed that are called Akasis because the Rentihorn doesn't exist yet. Uh, like officially, just in the virtual world, there is um, this Peak Finder app, and I know the the developer, and he changed Akasis Horn into Renti Horn, so virtually it's, it was changed. Um, few names were places were renamed after all after uh, uh, women of color, but I don't have so much time now to talk more about it. So the petition website was a good idea because. Um, 2012, we were contacted by Tamara Lanier. She's the great, great, great granddaughter of Renti. Um, her daughters noticed this website, and this was really something I couldn't have anticipated that this happens. This was really very powerful because she could speak about Renti, who he was as a human being, something that was completely taken off well, away from him. So she decided to come to Grindelwald, to this village near the mountain, where we could make an exhibition there about the racism of, of Agassiz, something that most people didn't know much about. Um, and it was kind of a little bit of a compromise because the mountain was not officially renamed. So she was there speaking about Renti, that he could, for example, read, that he was a spiritual man. And um, Hans also invited the descendants of Agassiz in Switzerland, uh, because he has a branch in Switzerland and a family branch in America because he ended up staying there. Uh, but they were not interested to come at all. They were very against this demounting uh, campaign, wanted to sue us and everything, but they didn't because we didn't invent anything. It was just about, you know, sharing and broaden up this history. Then much later, we've been keeping in touch with Tamara, who is maybe also online um, now with us. Um, I met her again in 2017 with my partner when we had a residency in Staten Island and I made her portrait. A photographer friend helped me in making this portrait. Then two years later, 2012, uh, 19, she filed a lawsuit uh, uh, against uh, Harvard that you see the first letter. This was also, she didn't, for example, get the uh, copyright to use those images of her ancestors. They didn't really believe her. And the, with this uh, lawsuit, she wanted the, oh, those images of her ancestors out of the ownership of uh, Harvard that represent her ancestors. They are like the, the human beings who are still uh, owned uh, by the institution. Um, and what happened then, this was quite much in the news and in the New York Times cover. Uh, and what happened then is that the descendants, American descendants of Agassiz saw um, 
this uh, this story and the other uh, the great 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 granddaughter of uh, Agassiz more she took contact with um, Tamara and asked if they can support her and now this comes now there comes the performative part. <laughs> I'm reading now the letter that was written signed by 41 descendants of Agassiz an open letter to Harvard University President Lawrence uh, Bakov and members of the Harvard Corporation and Board of Overseers from descendants of Agassiz regarding Tamara Lanier versus Harvard University. As direct descendants of Louis Agassiz, we celebrate many of his groundbreaking contributions to natural science. We also lament the widespread damage he wrought with the theory of polygonism, which he used to prolongate the supposed inferiority of African people. To, uh, for too many years, we have ignored this role in promoting a pseudoscientific justification of white supremacy. We see this as a collective failure to live up to our values of anti-racism and compassion. Now is the time to name, acknowledge, and redress the harm done by Louis Agassiz. In 1850, to support his theory that Africans descended from a different zone of creation than did Europeans, and thus were essentially inferior, Agassiz commissioned daguerreotypes of enslaved people living in South Carolina, among them Renti and Delia. We ask Harvard University to relinquish the daguerreotypes of Renti and Delia to their descendants, including Tamara Lanier, who has filed a lawsuit for their release. As enslaved people, Renti and Delia could not consent to be photographed. They were regarded as property, not human beings. For Harvard to give the daguerreotypes to Miss Lanier and her family would begin to make amends for its use of the photos as exhibits for the white supremacist theory Agassiz espoused. It is time for Harvard to recognize Renti and Delia as people. The daguerreotypes are, as Miss Lanier has said, family photos. At a time when racism, at a time when racism is ascendant from the streets of Charlottesville to the White House, we believe that both individuals and institutions need to take a stand and acknowledge our part in it, past and present. To claim that Agassiz was merely reflecting the popular ideas of his era would be selling his legacy short. He was a respected public intellectual and an active in. Um, influential advocate of racist ideas and policies. As an elite university, Harvard provided Agassiz intellectual legitimacy and together Harvard and Agassiz strengthened the myth that what we call race is a biological, not a social category. More than any other, this falsehood lays the groundwork for the ongoing subjugation, dehumanization, and extraction of wealth from people of African descent. In 2016, Harvard then President Drew Glimpin Faust said, Harvard was directly complicit in America's system of racial bondage from the college's earliest days. This is our history and our legacy. Yet, as recently as 2017, Harvard again used Renty's likeness on the cover of a textbook. Does the university want to continue to gain from an image stolen from enslaved people? Until Harvard commits to redress the harm it wrought, complicity will continue to define and mar its legacy. It is our hope that releasing the daguerreotypes will be the first step in the long overdue movement of reckoning and repair. We stand in solidarity with Miss Lanier and urge Harvard to join us. This was in June um, 2019. Unfortunately, they never responded. Nobody said anything. Um, the case was firstly dismissed, then it went, and, and her lawyers are Benjamin Crump, as you could see from the image, and uh, Josh Koskov uh, over there, represent her uh, for free. They offered her that they would like to help her. 
and then it went further. It got again dismissed, but then the uh, the they said that she could file a new lawsuit concerning the distress that it caused to her. And now when I asked uh, Tamara last week, she said the next meeting will be only in January next year. So they really uh, um, take too much time, uh, I would say. And um, when all this happened, I uh, felt I would like to revisit this archive, these photographs. And I used the, um, these this metal staples that have transformed of a kind of shooting back to a more of a stitching the colonial wound. I did something for the first time where I married um, the photographs with the staples. So I reproduced the photographs onto wood boards and I, I, I uh, tailored, so to say, the clothing um, as a way of reimagining freedom for Delia and Renti. Um, and I, I thought I would, you know, not just take any clothes, but look at images that were um, made of uh, uh, Frederick Douglass, most photographed man for the uh, Renti, and I have actually image also of um, the dress of Delia is inspired by the dress that was worn by Harriet Tubman. Um, I gifted this work to, to Tamara before it was, um, we knew what's the result, uh, but I really felt this is a work that is for her, for, the, uh, for Tom, Tamara. And what then also uh, was important for me is to also think about the other persons in the group because they all knew each other. It was a community after all. They don't have the Unfortunately, descendants out fight for their freedom. Now I have also this, I thought this might be interesting image. These are the images I was uh, looking at um, as inspiration for the clothing. And here are the other photographs. So meanwhile, the whole series is, is, uh, is this tailoring freedom series. Um, here at autograph, how it was shown, there was not, it was not yet complete. And last year, uh, I was able to complete it. Uh, and, and the whole body of work travels um, at the moment. And now I made it somehow a map because I don't have time to tell more about it. But anyways, does, this shows the work that grew from Switzerland where I was able to work on my own because I'm from Switzerland. And then I went uh, to Brazil because there is also places named after him in Brazil. All those places where I went are because uh, there were these places named after Agassiz. I started the Mixed Traces series where, I, uh, where I'm standing. Similarly, how he got, no time. Okay, I'll wrap up. <laughs> Similarly, how he photographed people in Brazil, for example, he produced their 200 photographs, also owned by the Peabody Museum, the whole archive. Uh, and I used my own body and placed it in landscapes named after Agassiz. Then I was in Aotearoa, New Zealand, collaborated, and now most recently in, in Alaska uh, with Clinkit uh, people, I was able to work and I'm editing now this um, reparative intervention. And this is the book about it. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> So thank you, Surya, and everyone involved in putting on this incredible event. In 1993, in the aftermath of Mabo and the establishment of the Native Title Tribunal, a group of communities from Australia's Great Sandy Desert met at Lampu Well at the northern end of the Canning Stock Route to explore making a native title claim. Kimberley Land Council Chairman and Claimant Kurun Jinpi, Ivan McPhee explained to those assembled that under native title, the claimants would have to prove three things. Our culture, our law, our traditional law, where we come from and who we are, and where we walked on the land. For the next four years, and working alongside the anthropologist Daniel Vachon and the manager of the Monkajah Art Center in Fitzroy Crossing, Karen Damon, the community would return to country and try to define the native title claim area. The question for them was how to establish in front of an Australian legal tribunal their culture and law, where they came from, who they were. In other words, what in the eyes of the native title tribunal would constitute proof of intergenerational land tenure? 
Then they made a startling decision. They decided to make a painting. The community, compromising 10 family groups and four language groups, first had to decide what kinds of stories to share with each other. In the words of senior community member Tommy May, when I was a kid, if my father and my mother took me to someone's, someone else's country, we couldn't mention the name of that waterhole. We used an indirect language, which we call Malkanini. We couldn't mention the name of someone else's country because we come from another place, from different country. They also had to decide what kinds of stories to share with the Australian Native Title Tribunal. So again, according to Tommy May, there are two ways for the old people from Jilla side. The first is not easy law. We do not touch that in our painting. The second is easy, like our kurta ceremony that we take to the city. We are happy to show garia, which is their word for white people, um, some things these days. We show people our country for mining and that sort of thing. Some people still worry about money. Some PNs say, we don't want to show Garia. They can say that easy. We don't want to show Garia for no reason. They might want to go sneaking back. We are allowed to say no to knock them back. We need to hold on tight to our story. And you can see there's an interesting tension in there around being asked to kind of perform a tradition in the eyes of the tribunal, which we can come back to later. So after agreeing that they would produce a collective painting, the group of artists made a second startling decision as to the contents of the painting. They decided to paint something that was common to all four of the claimant communities. They, de they decided to paint water holes, or what they called Jilla. So this is a satellite image of a dry salt flat, and the distance across the middle of the screen is about 14 kilometers. And that tiny dot um, in the screen is the Jilla. This is what a Jilla looks like. And this is an image, a section of the painting that depicts that jiller I just showed you. Um, the pale blue area, the, the jiller I showed you in the satellite image. The pale blue area indicates the entire salt flat. The blue and green circle in the middle is the jiller. And the jiller is shown at the scale of its importance, not its relative dimension. And the white radiating lines are extremely faint paths traced into the ground by generations of people walking back and forth to the jiller. The claim area they would seek to establish native title over was 83,886 square kilometers, which is about twice the size of the Netherlands. And Garliger Tommy May describes the process as follows. That big painting is for Jilla people, which is them, as evidence for our land claim. Native title is really a blackfella story. I believe that it is about blackfella law. The painting is only for proof. When I go to court to tell my story, I must listen very carefully before I open my mouth. Maybe the Gurria will say, we don't believe you. They might say, we don't believe you, we think that you're lying. There's a lot of people like that, I think. Some might be all right, some might believe us, but some don't. That's why we made this painting for evidence. The Native Title Act ex states explicitly that the crucial function of the tribunal is to facilitate mediation between Indigenous groups and other claimants, such as state governments or um, private parties. That is, once Indigenous claimants have demonstrated title to the land, the law hopes that the claimants will negotiate agreements with these other parties, whether for compensation or future rights. These agreements are referred to as Indigenous land use agreements. And the High Court may hear or review cases where the tribunal fails to facilitate agreement between the parties. And going to court is time consuming and typically, typically take over a decade to reach a conclusion. And it's really costly. It's in the order of tens of millions of dollars. Uh, this is a drone image of Binani in the, in the Great Sandy Desert where it was painted. Um, this is Binani during the wet season. So it becomes a lake for just a very short time every year. And you can see why this is such a sacred and important place for this community um, in a desert context, and also why they chose to, um, to paint the painting there, but also to hold the plenary session there. So in Australia, the state is the sole source of law. That law consists of public, verifiable statements. In the case of property claims, for example, maps, surveys, and title deeds are privileged kinds of artefacts for establishing the truth of tenure under Australian law. But Australia has another legal order in which the state is not the only source of law, where the law is orally transmitted rather than written, a law that values secrecy and initiation rather than public statements. So can Indigenous concepts of rights and duties to speak for country 
to take care of country be made commensurate with concepts of property, contract, and evidence. Absent of indigenous maps, surveys, and title deeds, how, to, how do native title claimants establish intergenerational tenure? So on May 10, in 1997, in Binini, on the edge of Australia's Great Sandy Desert, 40 indigenous artists assemble around the perimeter of a painting. The painting, uh, the canvas lies flat on the rust-colored earth like an iridescent carpet. It's been painted as proof of land tenure in a native title claim. Standing to one side near a row of white Toyota land cruisers are representatives of the state and federal governments who have traveled to Binini to hear the artist's testimony. As the plenary session begins, old men and women walk over to the painting one by one. As their turn to speak arrives, the artists stand on the part of the painting they have painted and talk about their country in their own language. The translation of their testimony appears straightforward, consisting of short statements addressed to the tribunal chair and the other artists, such as, this is my father's country, or this is my country, they describe their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. They name the jilla depicted in the painting and describe having to work at the cattle stations arranged along the Canning stock route. At the conclusion of each person's testimony, there is some applause until another artist stands to take their place. So if the artists present their testimony so that it conforms to the tribunal's understanding of their tradition and origin, the state can, through the delegated authority of the tribunal, elect to grant them title over the land. In other words, to secure their rights to their land, the artists will be asked to dramatize the very thing that white settler society sought to eradicate. Despite being the original inhabitants of the land, Despite the state stealing it from them, the state now calls for evidence, which it expresses as a series of demands addressed to the artists. Who are you? Where are you from? Where do you come from? But what, in the eyes of the tribunal, counts as evidence of their tradition? How does Fred Cheney, the deputy chair of the Native Title Tribunal, recognize what the painting says, if indeed it can be said to speak, beyond the kinds of statements made by the artists as they stand on it. From the perspective of the white settler state, testimony depends on the self-possession of the speaker and the impression of logical consistency in their speech. The straight, the state tries to negate the dissipation of the self and the asynchronic time of the dreaming by ordering the witness, by calling the witness to order themselves as owner of themselves as individuals. But here in the desert, the state's call to order becomes porous. The cordon the state tries to tape around the self can't complete the work of enclosure because the painting the cordon surrounds shimmers like a portal between realms, between other bodies standing in other times and in other places. The words of the artist's answers are diligently recorded by the tribunal's scribe, but the totality of their enunciation confounds documentation and escapes translation. It resounds through their assembly. It ripples through the rounds of shared silence and laughter that pass between them. The 40 artists respond to the liberal desire for alterity by making a painting as proof, by testifying on it, by holding the tribunal on country. They convene a polyphony in response to attempted enclosure. That ancestral chorus refuses the evidentiary to better evidence their own incommensurability. And in that momentous gesture of incomplete presence, that is also a withdrawal, they offer an invitation to white Australia to join them. So this is the painting that they made, and it's titled Nugara II. And it's so much more than a painting. Uh, it's a strategic intervention in a land rights claim, one that adopts and adapts traditional laws and stories about country to produce legal and political effects using aesthetic means, which makes it completely singular in an already rich tradition of Indigenous Australian cultural production. On one hand, it's a map in a cartographic sense, still, since it might be still said to point to things. On the other hand, it's far more than representation. It is indeed in a very material and literal sense country, as those involved in painting uh, have always pointed out. So when you stand on it, you're in country, no matter where that painting is. 
Uh, it's the expression of law and the way rights to tell stories about country are differentiated amongst different com community members. It's a historical narration of the emergence of the landscape. It's a site for ceremonies of cleaning, maintaining, and awakening. It's the embodiment of kin and the home of ancestors. And it's a carpet. You can stand on it. You can dance on it. You can let your dogs walk on it. It's a plan, both in the literal sense of marking out spaces for the artist's bodies to sit and paint their respective areas, but it's also a plan in the deeper and more profound sense of an intervention that attempts to shape a future action. So in the course of the final determination, 10 years after that first plenary session and 14 years after that initial meeting in Lampu Well, Justice Gilmore of the Federal Court of Australia concludes his judgment with the following words. Can I say that in making these orders, this court does not give you native title, rather the court determines that native title already exists. It determines that this is your land, and that it has always been your land. And then, don't cut me. <laughs> it's, 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 it's uh, we cut these people. <laughs> uh, so these are the artists who, uh, the 40 artists that made the painting. Um, and obviously there's so much to say, but um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. both so much for such an insightful and, and very intricate process in which you've both been thinking about work, making work. And I think for me, what struck me, you know, together is that this idea of collaboration, visual activism, and this idea of what advocacy looks like are so inherent and it appears both within the work, but also outside of the work with the people that, you know, that, that are engaged within that process. Um, I think for me, I'm drawn to this idea of intergenerational uh, mobilization that runs across both kind of works. Um, and this idea of what futurity looks like with that kind of sense of time and place. And I wondered if we could maybe start that discussion there. I mean, we obviously heard, Sasha, you were talking about Tamara's case uh, starting in 2012, and it's still ongoing. It's not been resolved. And in the case of the artists uh, that presented this painting, that case continues to kind of be fought against, especially with what's happened within the politics of Australia as well. So I wonder whether either of you wanted to kind of start there before we open it up to a wider Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> also, I would just like to respond actually to your uh, uh, presentation that it's in a way the fact that they have to make it is already... Um, is, is on the hand that you know the con they've been colonized and everything they should need to do and uh, convince anyone to say that this is their land um, yes and in Tamara's case it was in 2019 that uh, it, it started and um, um, and that in her, in this case of those photographs who, be, who kind of represent the human beings in a way. Uh, and that freedom suit that she is um, doing, which is one of the three ways of how to gain freedom, um, which is either of self-emancipation, uh, then on behalf of someone is this freedom suit. Uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, really, I'm, I'm curious what will happen out of this situation and, yeah. Asia Azale talks about, she says, you know, empires wage a war on intergenerational memories. And, and we know that, you know, one of the main things we see in Palestine at the moment, the number of institutions, universities that have been destroyed, etc. This is always a key component of the colonial project, the project of empire, which is to rob you of your own history. And, and the reason you're being robbed of your own history 
is because your history is a vector of strength and solidarity because because every time you know you resist you reactivate that history in the present and so it's not an accident that this is exactly and there are different ways that empires do it you know in Australia um, the idea of Aboriginality as a kind of black blood was meant to be bred out of you yeah uh, slavery through partisans uh, partum secretum ventrum um, which is the the kind of Virginia slavery act from the 1600s says that you know the offspring of a woman who is enslaved the offspring belongs to the owner um, and then there is, you know, just the history of like destruction that we know about and that is everywhere. And so for me, the um, actually what you know a kind of anti-colonial project does invariably is to try to reactivate those histories, those intergenerational histories. And I think what's really interesting for me and what's really exciting about this event is that there are so many ways to do that. The Shah Jarrah Architecture Triennial that um, was referred to in the introduction, you know, there was an entire exhibition about all of the different ways in which people have mobilized that kind of intergenerational relationship under conditions of extreme duress as a way of disfiguring loss and trying to um, resist. So. Thank you so much. Uh, my question's for Sasha, but I think can also be broader for everyone. Um, I first came across the daguerreotypes that you mentioned at the Carrie Mae Weems exhibition at the Barbican quite recently. I know that one of her series draws on those. I was wondering whether in your research you'd come across any other um, academic institutions who are considering those historic archives in interesting ways or rather working with contemporary artists who are doing so not just in the states but your practice more widely so, thanks uh, yeah very thanks exactly yes thank you for the question i i've been really focusing on the archive that uh, agassiz has commissioned specifically and i um, at the time, I was introduced to the ar archive while being invited to the demanding Agassiz uh, campaign and only later saw um, Carrie Mae Weems' work and then even later uh, the work of Brazilian Afro-Brazilian artist uh, Rosana Paulino who in makes interventions into the photographs um, and so on. So at the moment, I really focus just on these two archives. And then I make have been doing. Um, actually, it's not true. I've been uh, making portraiture works where I used images from the archive that I found online, and so on. So in that sense, yes, but not in relation to this more historical. And then actually also as part of the, the first portraiture series, I also um, work with with uh, images. So actually I am working with more archives, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both so much for such excellent, really wonderful uh, talks. My question is also for Sasha. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but I just wanted to ask if you could speak a bit more about the deliberate decision to use the staple gun and the staples. Uh, it would just be really interesting to hear a bit more about that specific decision. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting thing because the moment when I had the idea to use the staple gun is a moment I don't remember anymore. I just remember that I made a test with it. Um, or I don't know anymore why I wanted to use it, but I just somehow um, tried it out and then immediately realized that it has uh, lots of um, power in it because the weight of the tool is like a gun, the sound, you have to protect your ears and eyes and all that. So, And then it came together uh, with this moment of being frustrated of not going to Haiti. And then I realized, okay, I, I want to use this now as a way of responding to this uh, unjust history. 
but then quite soon after realized that I'm creating portraits of people that have been written down in history, that have done so much uh, harm that it felt like I want to stop to use my energy to make portraits of them, even though I also portrayed Agassiz in this way. But then I, I uh, shifted that methodology, methodology and it really became more of a stitching of the colonial wound because the result looks also like stitched, but it's something that goes under the surface, like under the skin and it's it's permanent and it's there's also lots of pain in there at the same time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. And it's been kind of like a red thread throughout the whole practice, but that kind of branched out to other medias then as well. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very so much for your contributions. Um, I have a question for Adrian. Um, I would like to pick uh, up on your comment uh, you made on uh, easy law and not so easy law. And I think um, you also kind of uh, think of tradition when speaking about law here. Um, and in relation to what the community actually wanted to share publicly, right? And then wanted to ask you how, how do you think translation, which you also talked about, the translation of the testimonies actually uh, what what role does it play? How is it activated? So should, yeah. So, in a way, I think the um, the translation, the words, uh, kind of didn't matter. Um, and what's so absolutely um, stunningly brilliant about these forty artists was um, so they recognise you know Australia's like a, a, a white liberal thinks of itself as a kind of tolerant multicultural society, yeah? So in its kind of self-conception, it's, um, it's curious about alterity, yeah? Uh, and, and is curious about the other. Um, but it also, and they know this, it wants the other to act like an other, <laughs> you know? And so, they, so, so in that distinction between what they share and what they don't share, they acknowledge that, the withdrawal of something from the court is it's like not evidencing things, yeah? Being uh, not, not secretive exactly, but, um, but not coming forward with everything is actually the best evidence that they can give that they're indigenous. So it's a kind of reading of the psychology of white Australia and kind of giving back, which is why I say, you know, that they... Um, it's a kind of incomplete presence, which is also a withdrawal. And in that moment, that becomes the best kind of evidence. Yeah. So, I mean, it's 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 yeah. I think that's that's what that's what I find just absolutely brilliant about this particular work. Um, Emma writes, those presentations were exquisite and deeply moving. Thank you so much. Could you both speak to the importance of modeling and disseminating these stories of white and white settler accountability and reparative practice? I feel like these are the stories that are never told. This is the repair we are so often told is not possible. Um, yeah, okay. I I think of something that sometimes I'm asked, as why people ask me sometimes, how can I contribute to this discourse? And yeah, and they feel often scared doing something. And somehow that comes to, to my mind. And, and I always say that, yes, they, they should, and also they should. They can, of course, because Without them, there wouldn't be that problem in a way somehow, and it's it's all connected together. Like it's um, there's just many different ways of how it can be done. Of course, that that can be difficult as well. But um, for example, my collaboration with Hans Wassler, he's he's from Switzerland, and I found it very very um, a good example of how one can work about history that mm, oftentimes one thinks it's a final like but actually it's always renegotiable history and also because it's always happening every day 
Um, so I think, yeah, that I, that I think I would like to say. Um, there's, there's a great CLA James quote. Um, it says, these are my people, these are my ancestors, they're yours too if you want them. Um, and it was, it was kind of repeated by a group of Indigenous Australians during the Uluru Statement, and they, they said also, um, this is a gift from the heart uh, for those who, are, who want it and who are ready to recognise it. And so I think there are all kinds of expressions of gift-giving and solidarity emerging through these kinds of projects from Indigenous groups towards white settler societies, unjustifiably, but nonetheless. Um, but, but the interesting thing about both of those statements is they have a kind of precondition. It's not just a, a freely given gift. It's a gift that's given on the condition that white settler society decolonise. Um, and it's an opening to create a joint future. Um, and I think, for me, I always try to keep those things in mind, that actually there are all continually these gestures of opening up, um, but the opening up needs, is, is dependent on, um, not on a kind of recognition, but on, a, you know, they're not offering you Indigenous identity. They're onto offering a joint decolonial future. Um, and I think with those kinds of things in mind, then um, for me that's a really good way of thinking about like how not dissemination is maybe not the a kind of slightly academic way of framing it, um, but about solidarity. Come on. I think that's yeah, a perfect ending. I think it talks a lot about this evolution of history and context in which we're learning and constantly unlearning a lot of different ideas and histories that we've all kind of been burdened with over many, many generations. But thank you all so much for bearing with us. I know we've run over. I think we'll come back at 4.20. There's tea, more biscuits, and help yourselves. But please be back for 4.20 for the final panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you.